watching that countdown. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, glad to see everyone here in person and those that are online. Good morning as well. Uh, some announcements to get us started this morning. And we haven't picked a place for this yet, but we're going to be having a men's breakfast on Saturday, November 5th. So keep an eye on our Facebook and our uh, website and we'll be letting you know about that. Okay. Um, we won't do it too early. You know, seven in the morning is kind of early for most of us. So we'll figure that out. Probably be like a nine, nine o'clock type thing. So um, if you have some place that you uh, would like to go, suggest just let uh, Pastor Mark or Pastor or myself know about that. Pastor Mark's biscuits and gravy. <laughs> well we'll be doing that some Sunday here very soon so we'll be having our, our uh, one of our breakfasts here. Um, then on the 12th uh, we're having the last or the final race of the Orange Track racing season. It's uh, season 17 it'll be I don't think race 164 we'll have the races and then the finals for each of the classes. Uh, more about that at orangetrackracing.org and then the following we're just going to stay busy all through the next couple of months on the 19th we're going to be having a free movie called christmas with a capital c and that'll be uh, at 6 p.m on the 19th doors open at 5 30. as always we will have uh, the hot dogs and the brownie bites and the free drinks and then somebody mentioned something about well, maybe some christmas cookies or something like that for the movie as well so we're looking forward to that uh, for more information about that and to watch the movie trailer, just go out to gracestreet.church and click on Grace Street Cinema, and uh, that'll be right there for you. And then, just as quickly, on the 27th, we start Advent. I can't believe that we are this close, especially after an 80-degree weekend, mm. that we are this close to Christmas. But uh, we'll be starting a new sermon series on the 27th, which is the first Sunday in Advent, called The Advent Conspiracy. And through this study and this sermon series, we're going to learn how to substitute consumption with compassion. Because Christmas, in, in the sense of, of our faith, has been just radically changed and is very consumeristic these days. We're going to talk about the concepts of worshiping fully, spending less, giving more, and absolutely loving all. And uh, it's, a, it's just a great... Uh, way to look at how we can redirect our, our energies. Uh, then on December 10th, since racing will be over, we picked another Saturday, on December 10th we're going to get together and we're going to visit some uh, of the local area nursing homes and some of our shut-ins and do Christmas caroling. Rumor has it we might come back for chili and hot dogs and stuff like that, so uh, more to come on, on what that will look like as well. And then on Christmas Eve, which is a Saturday evening, we'll be having our candlelight services. And then the following morning, Christmas morning, we will not be having church. So everything will happen on Christmas Eve. And then for those of you that are worshiping with us online, uh, we'll be putting the link to the worship set so you can watch all four of the videos and worship uh, along with us, even though we can't broadcast it for licensing reasons. So I think that's the most we've had for announcements in a while. So let's just take a moment and calm ourselves down and prepare for worship. Father, we just thank you for the day that you've given us. This, uh, we call it an Indian summer in past days, and I know that's probably not the right term for it anymore, but the, the weather has been absolutely gorgeous outside. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for the many blessings in our lives. We thank you that uh, Don has had been able to have family come and join him. Uh, I know he has been looking forward to the, this trip that they planned uh, quite a bit, and we're just so thankful for that. Father, be with uh, those of our congregation that are traveling today, and I know that uh, they'll be joining us online. So we just thank you uh, that you give them safe travel. Thank you for all your many blessings in our lives, Lord, and we just ask that you would prepare our hearts now for worship. So this morning's call to worship comes from Proverbs 21, 26. It's a very short proverb. It just says, some people are always greedy for more, but the godly love to give. And I was having a conversation before service about how uh, those who want more, even have more, can sometimes give off this different aura about themselves. They aren't 
necessarily as giving. And we're going to talk more about that in a little bit, but it doesn't really have to do, I think, with whether you have money or not. People can be greedy for more all the time. And we can see that as evidenced as I uh, heard a, a report that because sports betting is legal in Iowa now, that uh, gambling has just skyrocketed in our state. And I feel I'm really worried about those who are compulsive and may lose everything because that greed just gives them, uh, takes them down that rabbit hole. But I think we need to be greedy for what God gives us and God's love. And that's what the second heart part of this is, but the God they love to give. We love to give and we always uh, find ourselves in positions when you get into a generous heart, which is what we're going to really talk about today. Uh, when you have a generous heart, that giving just comes freely and very naturally. So that brings us to our sermon this morning. Our sermon is titled, When You Stop Holding Back. This is the uh, fifth of seven uh, sermons in this series called Predecide Better Choices, Better Life. It's really, we've talked about this over and over again, but when we make better choices, our lives are better because of it. And as I was, each week as I've been writing uh, the sermons, I keep looking back and being reminded of what my life was in the past and the decisions that I made in the past and how things have changed as I've grown in my relationship with God. Now, things change a lot. We've seen things change to the point where, you know, 50 years ago, back in the 70s, seems like just yesterday, 50 years ago, lots of things were different. Um, most pastors did preach from a pulpit and had a microphone, but the ability to videotape it or record it uh, with, with pictures, didn't exist. You could audio record them, but even another step to be able to broadcast them out over what didn't exist then and exists now, the internet, to be able to share that message just across a wider, wider uh, area. Well, there's something else that changed. Think about back in the 70s, and I know this is dialing it back quite a ways, but you remember the, the ads around TV or uh, they, they actually knew what they were about. There was no question that it was a McDonald's ad or that it was a Ford or a Chevy ad or whatever the ad was. There was something else different back then too. We saw an average of about 500 to 1600 ads per day. Now it's hard to believe, but then you gotta take into account uh, if you look, read the newspaper, uh, watching TV, magazines, billboards, things of that nature. So we did see, you know, 500 to 1600, depending on where you lived, was not un unusual. Um, then there was, you know, the Burma Shave signs where, you know, every, what was it, eighth of a mile, there was a new sign. Um, fast forward, like 37, 40 years, something like that. And with the advent of cable TV and all these other things, that 500 to 1600, jumped to up to 5,000 ads a day. Can you believe that, 5,000 ads a day? Fast forward to today, it's between 6,000 and 10,000 ads per day. In fact, the as I was researching this and to get these numbers, I saw probably 20 ads, just boom, that quickly. You know, that was static on the web pages that I was reading as well as the pop-up ads that kept popping up because you know you can't get by without those. How did we get by 50 years ago with so fewer ads? I think we looked more forward to like the Sears or the, Monkey, or the Montgomery Ward's Christmas catalogs, remember that? And then certainly afterwards, you, you kept those for years on end until they wore out because those were your booster seat at grandma's house. But the fact is, is that day in and day out, we are inundated by ads. In fact, if we really think about it, we had one, two, three, four, five, six different ads this morning as we talked about announcements. We were advertising things coming up. So you've already got six on your plate. I don't know what you had before you got here, but we have that going for us. But today, 
it's even scary. I don't know how many of you have Facebook. I know some of you do. But think about this. No sooner than you have talked to, verbally spoken, and, and I don't think it happens if you just think about it in your head, but no sooner be verbally spoken about something and you start looking through your Facebook and there's an ad for it. It just, boom, right there. It happens right away. It used to be a novelty. Do you remember when we started seeing product, what they call product placement on TV shows and movies? It was such a big thing. Oh, wow, look, they got Pepsi in that movie. That's just the way things are today. It's, it's people do that. And um, with cable TV and the streaming services and social media, ads are absolutely everywhere. And I don't know about y'all, but I'm sick of seeing them. I'm sick of seeing them. I don't know if that's going to help with my Facebook feed or not, but I'm sick of seeing them. Um, but here's the thing. Ads tell us that to be happy, we need to have more. Now I work in this, uh, outside of church, I work in a cell phone industry. And right now the ads for the, the new iPhone are just everywhere. You have to have this. And you don't just have to have the base model, you have to have the biggest and best one, the Pro Max. And make sure you get it with as much memory as you can for whatever reason. Culture just keeps telling us over over and over again that it is more blessed to acquire to accumulate it's not what we're used to hearing as christians right we're we're used to hearing it is more blessed to give than to receive but the ads our culture tells us it's more blessed to acquire or to accumulate and we hear that message 10,000 times a day so if we're hearing that up to upwards of 10,000 times a day what happens we start to believe it. The more and more we hear it, the more and more we start to believe it. But we go back to what Jesus said, and Paul records this in Acts 20, 35, and it says it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, uh, caveat to this is nowhere in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, or Acts, or anywhere in the scriptures other than in Acts do we hear this message, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Did you know that? But here, here's the interesting part. Paul would have known that Jesus had said that. So he is recording it as a first person hearer of that message. So it's just as accurate as if Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John had written it. At that time, that was a countercultural message. And 2,000 plus years later, it still is. find it so sad that advertisers now play into that message. They have taken this, it's more blessed to give than to receive message and tied it with their, it is more blessed to get or to acquire. It includes both sides. And the only thing I can think of is lead me not into temptation. That's what these ads are doing. They're, they're leading us into temptation. And the word in the Greek that's translated as blessed, it, it means happy. It means happier so to be blessed we're happier and so then it's telling us that we are happier if we have all these things but the ads are telling us that we're more joyful when we're giving so here give this because the ads have turned to that give this to someone but then it's also saying receive this to be fulfilled now if you're like me you like you like to give I would rather give than get. Some of the best presents that my wife and I get are magnets with pictures of our grandkids on it. They're not that expensive. I, <coughs> kids don't need to spend a lot of money on us. They've got, I said kids, they have their own kids. Our kids need to spend the money and take care of their own families, and that's where it's more important. But one of the things uh, that we've all been in is seasons where we feel like we can't be generous. We don't have to give. Well, generosity, that goes beyond just money and, and things. You may think, I want to give more now, but, but you just can't. Well, today we're going to be looking at what happens when you stop holding back and become irrationally generous. 
So let, let's, let's go together. Our Father, we ask today that by the power of your word, you would inspire us to be more blessed as we give irrationally, honoring you and making a difference in this world. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Now, if this is the first time you're joining us, whether in person or online, you may have missed the last few weeks. So let me just do a quick recap. Uh, this series is, a, like I said earlier, is about better choices, better life. And it's about having and taking over the power of our decisions. It's about pre-deciding now what we're going to do later. You know, you can pre-decide now to do something so when a certain situation comes up, you know how you're going to respond. It's not a knee-jerk reaction. And the quality of those decisions will basically determine the quality of our lives. Now, those of you that have been around a little bit longer than the others, you know the decisions you made in the past. You can look at those and see which ones were better and which ones were not and how they affected your life. And let's be honest, we've all made bad decisions. And so we can probably conclude, now I'm not gonna speak for everybody, we, I can conclude that I'm not the best decision maker. I have made some pretty ugly decisions because I thought I needed something and I wanted something so bad, whether that was a possession or anything else, that I made a decision to go after it. And that's why we have been discussing that before we get in the middle of it, before we're in the heat of it, that we need to make a decision of, and we'll pre-decide what our decisions are going to be. And because we are not the best at making those daily decisions, we get even worse when we're in the heat of them. Because we're not thinking rationally when we're in the heat of the moment. And by doing this, it allows us to pray about and seek God's wisdom before we have to make those decisions. And, and throughout this series and study, we are we're making six predetermined decisions about who we are going to be as followers of Christ. And we've talked about these each week, and I'm going to just repeat them again today. We are ready. We are consistent. We are devoted. We are generous. We are faithful. And we are finishers. We finish what we started. And this week, as we are pre-deciding and choosing ahead of time by the grace of God, we will be blessed by being more generous and blessed People too often think that means, oh, God's going to give us all this stuff. No, happier. We're going to be happier. So why do we need to pre-decide to be rationally generous? Because, honestly, none of us is going to just accidentally be irrationally generous. It just doesn't happen. We don't accidentally just give someone money for rent or groceries or donate to a food pantry or, or help. Uh, furnish someone's home. We don't just accidentally do that. We pre-decide ahead of time that we're going to do something like that. And when someone is being irrationally generous, they have pre-decided how they're going to give. Now that's whether that's giving to a charity or whether that's giving to a ministry or even to their local church. And as I was writing this, I, I kind of half-heartedly thought, Somebody's going to say, oh, you went through Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, I did. But it's interesting what he says. He says this, if you live like no one else now, later you can live and give like no one else. Now, I didn't understand that when I was 20. Because when I left my mom and dad's house, everything was given. Rent was paid, food was paid, utilities were paid. They paid for my clothes. I paid for my own gas. But I mean, they paid for most of it. And then as soon as you get out of the house, what happens is you're responsible for all of that. And you still want the things that you had growing up. So first thing I wanted when I got out on my own, got my own apartment, called up the local cable company and I ordered cable TV. And very quickly I found out that I couldn't afford cable TV quickly we had to cancel that we have to learn and how we're going to spend our money we have to live now 
in a certain way so that later we can do more. I, I've talked to several of you that you were living your life a specific way now because you have goals, you know what you want six months from now, a year from now, or more. You've made those decisions. You've pre-decided how you were going to live your life. Now, if we back paddle to those ads, you know, I talked about getting cable TV. Well, what about the need, you know, you want a new car, you want a new cell phone, you want, you want, you want, or you say, I need, I need, I need. And I, we give our kids a hard time because they say, well, I need a new vehicle because it's getting old and it's starting to cost money to, you know, keep up. That upkeep's a lot cheaper than that monthly car payment is. So, and the insurance goes down the older the car gets. So, you know, it's mm -hmm. how do you want to live your life in the future? Do you want to saddle yourself with so much debt? I know my wife and I are counting down our mortgage. <laughs> we're down under that three and a half year mark. And we're so excited about that. But in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I hope we don't have to move. You know, what, what if something happens to us that we can't, because it's a split level, so you go up the steps to get into the house, and then you have to either go down the steps to the basement or up the steps to the inside. So now my mind's starting to, to spin that way. But we're planning now for later, so we'll be okay if that happens, because we pre-decided. And when you think about generosity and you think about how you're going to live in the future it, it's a hard thing it's a spiritual thing it's it's well it got me to thinking about this article i read here uh, just a while back it's, there's a guy named dale schroeder he was a carpenter in ames iowa and dale passed away back in 2005 but 14 years before he passed he went and saw a lawyer now, Dale was a frugal man. He didn't spend a lot on himself, and he never married. Well, he went to that lawyer to set up a, a fund. And that this is 14 years before he passed. So he's pre-deciding a long ways before he, before he passed away. He pre-decided that he wanted to give small-town Iowa kids the opportunity to go to college without being saddled in debt. was able to rationally provide for 33 students to go to college debt-free. That's irrational generosity. And here's the only stipulation he had, and this is for those, you know, and some of these kids became doctors and teachers and therapists. The only ask was is that they pay it forward. They live irrationally generous lives as well. He had lived like no one else, so he could give like no one else. That's rational generosity. But it's not just those who have money that are generous. In fact, I found that those who have less are often the most generous. Listen to this from Mark chapter 12, verses 41 and 44. It says, Jesus sat down near the collection box in the temple and watched as the crowds dropped in the money. Jesus was a bit of a people watcher. He liked to see what they were going to do. And he watched as many rich people put in large amounts of money. Then a poor widow came and dropped in two small coins. Now, I'm going to break from this for just a second. I'm imagining that those who had more looked at her and thought, wow, that, look, she just gave two small coins. Well, here's the thing. Jesus called his disciples to him and said this. He said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions. For they gave a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. That's a lot. When you think about it, the way God sees it, generosity is not about what you have or do not have. This poor widow gave rationally generous 
funny or not, getting some people to be generous can be like trying to get that last drop of toothpaste out of the tooth. You ever try to do that? You're sitting there squeezing it out. I know I've been guilty of getting that last part out by sucking it out of the tube. But I think that people want to be generous at, the, at their very core. Most of them just don't know how, and a lot of them don't think that they can. Some will rationalize that someday, maybe when I have more, I will give more. But that's not the thought process of a generous person. You don't just, like I said earlier, you don't just become irrationally generous. And it, so it's not about what you have or what you don't have. It's a hard thing. If you're not generous now, you will not be generous later. Even if you had the money that you said it would take to make you generous. We need to pre-decide today to be generous. If we don't, we'll become like the rich farmer in Luke 12, 13 and 21. And in uh, the New Living Translation, this section is called the parable of the rich fool. It says this, then someone called from the crowd, teacher, please tell my brother to divide a father's estate with me. Jesus replied, friend, who made me a judge over you to decide such a thing as that? Then he said, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much then he told them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Then he said, I know, I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything you worked for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. Now, nowhere in this parable do we hear the rich man say, now that I have more, I will give more. I'm thinking if he had the response from God may have been different. The parable would have changed. But instead of giving uh, to his uh, synagogue at the time, is what it would have been, or to the orphans and widows, or helping out those in need, or if we think about it in today's terms, giving to a church or, or to a men or women's shelter or helping people to go to college, what did he do? He tore, he tore down perfectly good barns just to build bigger, newer, bigger ones. We see that kind of waste all the time. I think about that when I think of the the NFL football teams. How many of them want bigger and better stadiums? So they want to spend billion dollars or one and a half billion dollars on this new stadium. And then I look at teams, other teams who have been in the same stadium for 20, 30, 40 years. Guess what? They don't play any differently on the new field. But from this parable, this man had never pre-decided to be generous. But he had pre-decided, whether consciously or subconsciously, to be selfish. So let's listen to verse 21 again. But this time, this comes from uh, the message translation. It says, that's what happens when you fill your barn with self and not Jesus teaches us that having more does not change who we are, rather it reveals who we are. But being generous is ultimately a sign or a part of one's identity. So to help all of us get there, I'm going to share with you a couple of principles that are true for all generous people. The first of those is generous people plan to be generous. So generosity, like we talked about before, is not random. So when I think about generosity, I think about uh, 
people who might pay for someone else's meal or someone else's coffee behind them in the drive-thru. Um, now, there's this, there's this commercial that's on TV, and Diane didn't know when we were talking about this the other night that this was actually going to be in the sermon, but there's this TV from a car company that is encouraging you to give to or to do something special for either your dog or to adopt an underdog. And they tug on your heartstrings because they have one of the dogs, is, his back legs don't work, so he's on this little, he's got little wheels strapped to him. And one of the dogs is blind, and one of them's only got three legs, and they really tug at your heartstrings. But they're asking us is to be, actually be generous. Yeah, they're trying, they do want to sell cars. I'll give them that. But they are, in this instance, trying to call us out to be generous. Now, how many of you have gone to the grocery store, to a clothing store, wherever, and you get to the checkout and they say, um, would you like to uh, level up or do you want to raise up the amount that you're giving? You know, go to the next dollar amount. See, when you're generous, you see a need and you meet a need. You go to a fundraiser, you might have a meal, you might hear a great speaker, and then what happens? You are inspired to either give a one-time or recurring gift. Now, there's nothing wrong with these types of things. But when someone pays for your meal or your coffee in the drive through or you see this ad on TV, or you they ask you at the checkout, it almost feels like you're being guilted into giving rather than it being a choice. Because how many of you want to say no to that cashier? But you really can't because you don't want to look bad. Generosity is not about being guilted into it. It's not a reactive thing. People who are generous have a plan, like the carpenter we talked about did. Scripture does tell us this. Isaiah 32, 8 says this, but generous people plan to do what is generous, and they stand firm in their generosity. They plan and they stand firm. They're straight and to the point. And those that are generous have it literally built into their budget or into the way that they, they plan their lives. When it comes to finances, most people have a plan. Whether you have a budget or not, you have a plan. You're going to spend it. You know what you're going to spend your money on. You have a plan. But have you pre-decided in that plan to give? The generous people would have planned to have given to the person behind them in the drive-thru. Not thinking about it, making the person behind them feel guilty to maybe pay for the person behind them. But you sometimes will run into, a, there's a string, and I forget how many cars it was, but it was just a constant. Everybody was paying for the person behind them, and it got to, into the hundreds. It was quite the thing. And I don't know if anybody ever felt guilty about it, but to get that far, at some point, there had to have been a lot of generous people in there to not stop that. Generous people prayerfully ask God how they can make a difference with what they have and then they do it. It's a strategy versus a reaction, or it's intentional versus random. And I hate to break it to you, but we all have some sort of plan, like I mentioned, written or not. And granted, because we're not really good at making decisions, that plan might not always be the best. For some, the plan is simply a few things. Work, get paid, pay the bills, repeat. And sometimes you might get a raise. Yay! More money. What am I going to do with it? One or two things happens then. You play catch up with the bills because you got behind because of the decisions you've made. Or all too often what happens, I've got an extra hundred dollars a week. I'm going to go buy more. I can go buy that new phone now. I can go buy this now. Even worse is all the places that you can go today in person or online to get an advance in your pay. Payday loans. 
they'll pay you today. There's apps out there where you can get paid. And then you owe them your check plus 25%. That's not making good decisions. That's having a money problem. And ge being generous isn't a money problem, it's a spiritual problem. We are trusting in things like the rich man did with his crops rather than putting our faith in God. Matthew 6.33 from the Amplified Version of the Bible says this, But first and most importantly, seek, aim at, strive after his kingdom and his righteousness, his way of doing and being right, the attitude and character of God. And all these things will be given to you also. So you see, it's not about seeking stuff. It's about seeking God. Being irrationally generous means making real changes to put God first. It means strategically looking at your life instead of arranging things around what you want. You arrange things and your life and your priorities around God. It changes your perspective. I remember 20 some plus years ago when my then girlfriend, who is now my wife, um, she started dragging me to church. And heaven forbid, you know, you're sitting in the pew and the sermon's over. You glance to your left or to your right and here comes that plate. The dreaded take it, you look at it, people have been putting stuff in it, you feel like you know, God, guilt is kind of running through here, you can you know, better put something in. Over time, you know, we started putting something in, thank, thank you Lord that there were offering envelopes, because nobody could see how much you were putting in there, whether it was a couple dollars or whatever. We don't pass the plate here. If you feel led by God to, to give and this is certainly not a message about tithing, but if you feel led to give to the church, we have a basket over on the table and you, people can give there if they so uh, feel led. But for me, it was that dreaded plate coming. But then something weird happened. Because I, I, I was coming out of my desert time. I had, as a kid, I had gone to church all the time. I was in the choir, I was in youth group. I, in Boy Scouts, I was the chaplain's aide. I literally led worship on Sunday mornings on our camp house with a bunch of other teenage boys. But I wondered. And Diane brought me back. And, and I started hearing the messages. And then I started reading my Bible. And I started having a change of heart, a spiritual change. And as that spiritual change happened, And pretty soon it wasn't about feeling guilty about putting it in the plate. It was honoring God through the giving. And it was giving in proportion to what we had. It wasn't a matter of, oh, i got to give all this money to God. It was giving in proportion to what we had. It changed. It was more, it wasn't about making sure the pastor was paid, which here we don't pay our pastor. We do this because this is what we're called to do. Or, and we don't have a secretary to pay, so it's not about paying a secretary. We do have to keep the heat and the cooling going and the water on and the lights and stuff. But it became about trusting God and worshiping Him. Too often the following verse is used to shame people into giving and not only that, but to tithe 10% or more. The following passage is a call to repentance. Because the people had broken the old covenant by not with or by withholding their tithe. Malachi 3, 6, and 12 says this: I am the Lord, and I do not change. That is why you descendants of Jacob, Jacob, are not already destroyed. Ever since the days of your ancestors, you have scorned my decrees and failed to obey them. Now return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of heaven's armies. But you ask, how can we return when we have never gone away? Should people cheat God? You, yet you have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? And the Lord said, you have cheated me of the tithes and offerings due to me. You are under a curse for your whole nation has been cheating me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you, I will pour out a blessing so great 
You won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. This is the only place in the Bible God says to put him to the test. And this is the reason why in, in verse 11 it said, continues saying, Your crops will be abundant, for I will guard them from insects and disease. Your grapes will not fall from the vine before they are ripe, says the Lord of Heaven's armies. Then all nations will call you blessed, for your land will be such a delight, says the Lord of Heaven's armies. Now, without studying this passage, at first hearing, this passage does sound a lot like prosperity preaching. You give, you receive. And unfortunately, that's the way it's been used. This passage is actually about trust and worship. And when we started giving more, we were blessed in the sense that we had everything we needed. We might not have gotten more, but we had everything we needed. In fact, our, our bank account never seemed to go down. We always had the same amount in it. So we were blessed. And when we started giving more, we continued that and we also started trusting God more because we saw how faithful that he is and had been to us we learned to be generous we not only give to the church we also give to a ministry that works with youth and another ministry that works with women in crisis due to pregnancy in verse 10 it tells us to test him in a positive way not a negative way it says, do this good thing of bring your tithes to God's temple, and he will pour out a blessing. It's, again, the only time that we're invited to test him. And I can attest to what happens when you do this. In fact, let's change this thought of being a prosperity preaching to it being a generosity gospel. It's a change of heart where we put God above ourselves. God has proven faithful to us over and over and over again. God gave us a perfect example of what irrational generosity looks like in John 3, 16. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. See, God had predecided to share with us this ultimate example of irrational generosity. And when we do this, when we give that way, our priorities change and the trajectory of our life changes as well. And when that happens, what does our faithful God do? He provides. He blesses. And again, remember, blesses isn't just handing out money. We are happy. He shows us again and again how faithful he is. And when this happens, our faith grows and our worry lessens because we know that God has us. There's a, a new ad campaign out there called he gets us. It's a hundred million dollar campaign to make Jesus known. He gets us. God gets us. He has us. He provides. He blesses over and over again. And it's honestly has us looking at ways that we can be more generous to others by predeciding what we want to give and to whom. And that gets us to our second principle. Generous people round up, or we level up. We have predecided when we go out that we are going to round up. In fact, last night we went to one of our more favorite barbecue places, and uh, we rounded up. And then Dan goes, "Yeah, let's get that extra." It was like thirty oh one or whatever. Make sure we give her that penny, <laughs> so that she doesn't have to figure out change for herself, right? leveled up. Now, secularly, we do things like that all the time. My 401k, it's at work, it's set that every year, a little bit more comes out of it, out of my paycheck going towards it. I don't miss it because I don't see it. Years ago, I used to do a Bible study for some high school students at the Penn Everett up here on Collins, and I met one of the co-owners of what was then Brothers Three Homes. Now, they're no longer open, but he was telling me it was him and one other guy that owned the business. It's like, I'm trying to think, where's the three come from? And he explained that to me. The third person was the Holy Spirit. So of the company profits, he got a third 
the part his other partner got a third and they gave a third to God. And they were able to give pianos and all kinds of things to churches and schools. They were leveling up, they were rounding up. That is irrational generosity. And it doesn't have to be about money either. Think about the Good Samaritan. What did he do? He stopped and he helped someone no one else would help. And he didn't just stop and bandage him up and leave him there. What did he do? He put him on his donkey, took him to an inn, and he paid for him to be cared for. Then I also think of Zacchaeus. Now, if you remember from your childhood, that song might be running through your head now, and I apologize. But Zacchaeus had been a tax collector. He was awful. But when God got a hold of him and his heart changed, what did he do? He rounded up. He didn't just give back what he stole. He gave back four times what he stole. That is huge. And it's not about waiting until you have more. It's, not, it's about being generous with what you already have. So here's a way to start. When you buy something like a new shirt or a pair of pants or a coat, turn around and give one away. One in, one out. Then as you are generous in the little things, you'll become more generous in the bigger things. You will start leveling up. You will start rounding up as you go. See, being stingy is not a money problem. It's a spiritual problem. So stop trusting in yourself and start trusting God. Being generous will not happen by accident. You will have to plan for it. And just like any plan, you need to stand firm in it. Sometimes those plans can take time because of the decisions and the reactions that we've made in the past. So cut yourself some slack. Give yourself the same grace, mercy, love, and forgiveness that God gives you. Pre-decide now how you will be generous in the future and then work your plan. You may not be able to be overly generous now or rationally generous now, but if you work your plan, you will in the future. So don't just give because that is just something we do. Be generous because that is who you are. Father, as we uh, take in everything that you have taught us this morning about being irrationally generous. It's not about having a lot. It's about a mindset. It's about how we see you and worship you, Father. Let that be our guiding principle, that we worship you, that we love you, and that we do need to cut ourselves some slack and be just as loving, just as gracious, just as forgiving and have just as much mercy for ourselves as you give to us. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Sixteen. We go back to the generosity. This is a reminder of God's generosity. We don't necessarily always see it that way, and it's not something that we just do every every week. This is about remembering what God did for us and His irrational generosity. For on the night that Jesus was betrayed, He took bread while He was eating with the disciples, and He broke it, giving it to His disciples, saying, "This is My body, broken for you. Take." A little later in the meal, he took the cup and he poured more wine into it, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and the sins of many. Take and drink. We're reminded by scripture, as often as we do this, we do so until Christ returns. We do it out of worship. The body of Christ broke the blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Gracious Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for what this meal represents. That through it we are reminded of your generosity, your grace, 
your mercy, your love, and your forgiveness. We don't do this, Father, just because it's something that we do, Father. We do it in remembrance of what you did for us, what Jesus did for us on the cross. In Jesus' name. now we are into our time of our service where we pray for the people and we give God all the glory for the things that he has done. Um, Pastor Mark and, and his wife, are they've traveled to Raleigh and, and they're going to be in that region uh, for Mark's work, but Lori, by the grace of God, has been able to go with him to spend some time with him. Um, unfortunately for work, Mark travels weeks on end out of the year and they are a part, so this is a wonderful thing that they get to do that. We're so thankful that uh, Denise and Steve have been able to go on vacation and to leave the rat race behind and just spend some time together, get some healing and some relaxation and see some family. That we've gotten to meet Don's family this morning. We're so thankful that you were able to join us today. Thank you, God, for giving them safe travel here. We pray you have a wonderful, wonderful week. Danny, we're so thankful to see you back. I'm glad you had a, a good trip down for your sister's um, service this past week. Now, Diane, tomorrow has her second cataract surgery. Uh, hopefully, by tomorrow afternoon, she won't be going like this, trying to read things or see things during the day. But we pray for Dr. Who and, and his um, medical team as they do the cataract surgery. Uh, also, give praise for who he is because he is also uh, a Christian and he, the first time that we met him, he had just gotten back from a missionary trip where he and several other doctors went down and did cataract surgeries down in Mexico for those that couldn't um, have that care, number one, or even afford it. So we're just blessed of that. Um, blessed by the beautiful day. Are there any other prayers or praises? Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for what this day means. We thank you for all the many things that we get to pray for you, Father. We, uh, we've got a list that we pray for corporately every Wednesday and then daily, individually, Father, for these people who are sick and hurting. We pray for our ministry, Father. We pray for all of the things that are happening in our world. Father, I know that your book your scriptures, your love letter to us tells us that the days will, are going to get worse. But Father, we pray for a revival right here, right now. That people would come to know you. Father, it's not our, our desire to see people not have a relationship with you, to, to end up separated from you in eternity, Father. We want people to know you. We want people to spend eternity with you after they leave their earthly home. Father, thank you for all that you've done for us and all the, the opportunities that you give us to pray and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this concludes our online portion of our service. Uh, again, for those of you who are worshiping online, check for the link in the comments and you'll find the uh, playlist there. Before we go into our time of worship, let's just close out with a word of prayer. Father, we pray today that we would be a church known for our rational generosity, that we know it is more blessed to give than to receive. Father, I want personally to pre-decide to be generous, and I pray that others would too. God, help us be generous. God, help us to prayerfully and strategically design our lives around a spirit of generosity. God, help us to start by trusting you, by putting you first, but not stopping there. God, give us eyes to see how you want us to prayerfully and strategically plan to make a difference in this world. And God, we thank you in advance that we will find a joy unspeakable, knowing it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. God, make us more generous. Help us God, be generous with what we have now so that we will be infinitely more generous when we have more later. And let us store that in our hearts. In Jesus' name.